you, uh, like she said. My name is Jessica Uche. I'm the country director for Native Teams in Nigeria, and uh, I handle business and operations across Nigeria and wider Africa. Uh, the keynote is to discuss payments and banking in Africa, where we are coming from, uh, where we are now, the progress we've made so far, and what the future is going to be or looks like as the case may be. Okay, so if you are in the fintech sector or in the financial sector, one very interesting clause that we hear for founders building fintech products is we are trying to bank the unbanked or, or the underbanked. And so uh, recently we have seen developments of products across several financial sectors. Credit, cross-border payment, uh, even down to what we know right now as mobile money, which is also a form of, um, a form of payment and banking system. Uh, not sure. Thank you. Uh, so evolution of payments in Africa, starting from the 1970s till like the 2000s, payments was something like uh, you have to enter into a physical bank, create a bank account that is probably going to be activated uh, one week or maybe two weeks after you have filled all of the forms in the world, and then <laughs> You have to share your account details to someone, they send you money, and uh, you have to come back to the bank perhaps three days or four days later to check if the money is already in your bank account. And then you have to queue to withdraw the money. And then you also have to queue to deposit some of that money into your bank account, which will probably reflect three days after again. And then you go home with some of the cash. That's where we are coming from. I remember specifically that uh, when my dad traveled abroad sometime and my mom needed to send him some money, my mom went all the way from Anambra to Lagos, to Kutono, to be able to send money. As at then, I, 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 I thought the trip was unnecessary. I, I, I didn't understand why someone should go that far just, just to give someone money. And so when I was going to speak on this topic, I called my mom and she said, as at then, there was no way to send money abroad, even from Nigeria. And so she had to go all the way to Kutonu, from Anambra to Lagos to Kutonu, that's traveling like seven seas and seven mountains just to get money and then coming back. Uh, right now, next. What we have, however, is a development. What we have, however, is a development that has brought some sort of, uh, maybe not closed the gap, but reduced the gap. So what we have now is uh, ability for people to open bank accounts right from their mobile phone. And in two minutes, you have an active bank account that can receive deposits and credits, and you can also send out money. So it becomes open a bank account, share it with someone, you receive money. We even have instant settlements now, depending on the part of Africa that you are in. If you are Nigeria, NIBSS is your savior. If you are in Ghana and some part of East Africa, thank God for mobile money and uh, M-Pesa as well as some sort of Central Africa. Uh, if you're receiving cross-border payments, though, you may have to, you will have to do some sort of conversion and swap, which used to be physical then, still some sort of physical now, but what we have is FinTech platforms that are enabling you to do all of this on your phone in about, okay, Give or take the time the money comes from US or UK, this might take about three to four hours where you receive FX, you do the conversion, 
you send it into your local bank account or mobile money, whatever it is. And in a whole day, you have received money abroad, you have sent to all your family members that are billing you for black tax, and you have deposited the rest into your bank account. The same thing is applicable to banking, but let's talk about what triggered this evolution in Africa till now. Migration. Africans are everywhere. I mean, we're in Africa, but we're also in everywhere that is not Africa. And people have always needed to send money back home. Africa is known for communal living. We were trained by our community. And so when you go abroad, you're expected to make some money and also send money home to kind of train other people. Recently, talent outsourcing from Africa. With platforms like uh, Andela, who opened the gap for countries outside of Africa to explore and export talent. Initially, these companies may want to hire physically and sponsor your relocation to where they are, but then came COVID, and companies realized, oh, you know what, you actually don't have to relocate to Canada. Please work from Nigeria, or work from Nairobi, or, or work from Accra, but you're going to work for us, contractor-based, and we are going to pay you. Now, that, that becomes a problem because the companies has, they, they have to pay you in FX, but you don't spend FX in, in, in Africa. You spend the local currencies. So there became the problem of how to receive this money in the first place, but also how to convert it to your currency so that you can spend it. If you have 10,000 USD in your bank account, you can go to the woman selling pepper on the road and you give her dollars. I mean, she's going to be happy that someone is presenting her dollars, but she would rather you pay her in the currency that she bought her goods with because that's the currency she's going to need to um, buy when she's short of supply. So we needed payments platforms that will enable us to do all of this. There's also the rise of remote work adoption by global companies. I've mentioned that COVID wasn't a good thing, but it opened the market it opened the sector to become a wider one to not just uh, accommodate migrants, but also remote workers from across Africa to receive into Africa, spend across Africa, and also be able to send out from Africa. I'm sure some of us have wise accounts here, so you understand what I'm talking about. Then, the quest for a less rigorous payment process for cross-border payment, general pay payment, really. If you earn money, and every month you have to walk into a bank to withdraw FX, which is usually in short supply, we know, and then you have to queue to convert it, and then you have to send to your bank account. That's very rigorous, and so it's best to just do everything on your phone, transfer to your mobile money, hold the cash you want to hold, go to the market, spend with POS. This is the evolution of payments in Africa from 2010 to date. So if you check that, you will see that um, the process has reduced from six to five, and in some, in some places from six to four. The topic says the gap in the market, the market in the gap. So are we closing the gap? The gap is not fully closed, but it's, it is a gradual process it's not where we were. It's, it's definitely a substantial process. We also have the cryptocurrency and the blockchain helping with this. Um, one minute. Previous slide, please. What triggered the need for this innovation includes things like cashless policy. I remember recently in Nigeria, we were pretty short of cash. And so everybody had to some sort of uh, download OP, palm pay, you know. Everybody had to pay their bookie that's selling pepper with 
you know, with their phone. Even roadside sellers had to resort to that. Cashless policy has encouraged a whole lot of financial development. I have to give it, I have to give it that. We still use cash, right? But what we have now is a situation where people are no longer averse to saying, Madam, they collect transfer, Abby. Madam, you no get POS. Madam, I no get cash. Oh. I remember I paid, I remember I paid, uh, <laughs> the keke driver posted it on, on his screen that he collects transfer. I had cash, but I wanted to see, and you know, it was pretty cool to do that. Uh, encourage more faceless and cashless banking. I don't remember the last time I walked into a banking hall, I promise you. Uh, if I want to open a bank account now and you ask me to come to the banking hall, I'm simply not going to bank with you. It means you're either not moving with the trend or you do not understand that people no longer have the time to walk into the bank hall. And so you should only go into the bank hall if it's absolutely necessary, probably where you need to sign your signature. What this has done is also swifter banking for businesses. The woman who sells turkey and chicken to me, she has POS. I literally go to the market with no cash and I buy everything I need to buy and I'm not just speaking for Nigeria. Here in Ghana, Momo, uh, when I was in Rwanda, I also used the uh, MTM mobile money when I was in Nairobi, I used, I used M-Pesa. I, I literally did not have a need to hold any cash. And it worked, everybody was, everybody was happy. What it has also done is that business owners are now able to se separate their personal accounts from their business accounts. It used to be the case that if you have a personal account, it takes time to open business accounts and so, you have business owners collecting money using their personal accounts, but now it is so easy that we have fintech platforms that open businesses, business accounts for you, you don't have to do anything. They even bring POS machines for you. And so if your customer says, I have my card, okay, madam, savings or current. There's this joke we make in Nigeria. Don't go outside, outside is expensive. The only thing there is savings or current. Once you step outside your house, people are not saying, madam, give me 2,000. They're already pressing POS. Madam, your bill is 4,250, savings or current. They expect that you have your card and they are, you know, they are ready to take the money from you. Next slide, please. Innovation result, of course, numerous payment options. These days when you go anywhere, really, people are open to collecting bank transfers. They are open to sending you payment links where you impute your cards and payment is done. They are also very much open to POS. Swifter inter and intra-bank settlements, like I said, NIBSS founded in 1993, became operational in 1994. You are able to transfer money from one bank account into another bank account and it drops in two seconds. I kid you not, immediately. You transfer from Momo to Empress, the, the person, the settlement is instant. So these are the result of the innovation that we've had so far. Before, this would take hours, days before it happens. Like I said earlier, increased business banking, then rise of local and regional PSPs, PSSPs, the likes of Flutterwave, Paystack, right? local and regional P2P settlements. So payment in Africa has gone beyond into Africa. We have also expanded to across Africa. Now we have FinTech platforms where I can transfer money from here to Uganda. And the person will, will receive the money in Ugandan currency and I probably transferred from my NGN wallet. And so if I have a family who is in Uganda or in Rwanda, it's, it's instant. Before, it used to be the case that you can only send to US, UK, USD, but now we have also introduced P2P, regional and local bank settlements, which is amazing because I am of the point of view that 
uh, yeah, bring in dollars and send out dollars, but what of spreading dollars across Africa, regional collaboration and trade? Next slide. Thank you. Powering these innovations, uh, when you come to West Africa, Nigeria specifically, the government, CBN, thankfully, in collaboration with uh, other banks, have what we call the NIBSS. I have to say, these guys are doing amazing work. Sometimes even I am shocked at how instant money moves. For Ghana and the wider East Africa, we have Safaricom with M-Pesa. We have uh, MTN, Nigeria with Momo. We have Tingo with Airtel. What this has done is that banking has been decentralized to the bare minimum, to the least. With your phone number, which is like the fastest number anybody crams now, you can receive money and transfer money. You don't even have to cram your bank account because sometimes that will, you have four or five bank accounts, so how do you cram all of them? But you can call your phone number for someone. If you're in Nigeria, they are simply going to transfer it with OPE or Pampe. If you're here, they are going to use MTN or Tingo, whatever it is. So just the way someone says, ah, yeah, can we connect? Yeah, 081327. That's how banking is. Uh, then we have the PSS, PSPs, the likes of Flutterwave, <laughs> InterSwitch, Paystack, MoneyPoint, and also native teams who enable us from anywhere and everywhere to process both collections and payout in multiple currencies, in multiple countries, such that if you're, if, you're, if you're a fintech platform and you're looking to expand into several countries, you don't even have to build out your own process, just run a partnerships, making things way easier for us in terms of banking. A gap in the market There are still untapped opportunities in the payment and banking system in Africa, no doubt. Right now, and I'm seeing the rise in wanting to build around credit, which is something really good because we need that. Uh, our local operators, farmers, business owners need to have uh, you know, a system that shows that they are credit worthy so that companies can give out loans and you know, all of that. This time, I believe uh, focus should be more on grassroots penetration to serve users with little or no access to smartphones. Most of what we do is done on smartphones, let's be frank. You have to send someone money from a smartphone. Banking the unbanked, we are doing a very great job at that. A large majority of people are now banked. So even if you don't have bank account numbers, you have your phone numbers, and that serves as some sort of banking for you. But we still have some parts, actually a good number, that are underbanked. So that's definitely one that we need to plug. A market in the gap, frankly, one thing Africa gives you is a huge market. A huge market, but with segmented, fragmented market needs. What, what East Africa needs is sort of different from what Central Africa needs if you localize the, the payment and banking uh, requirements in that country. So Africa presents you with the opportunity to choose a problem and demography to solve for, and you're making your money. In the race to generate revenue and profit, uh, this becomes a bit dicey. Uh, because even though the African market is huge, it is more commission-based than subscription-based, right? Value delivery before revenue. And so founders start asking themselves, now monthly MRR, ARR, but what is the profit? There's a difference between revenue and profit. Founders are mentioning that uh, while we are processing a ton of money, not a lot of it is, a, is, is profit, right? And uh, a good number of these startups, a good number of these are startups, and you have to give investor updates. Your investor wants to make money. 
They just don't want you to show them the volume that you're doing. In five, 10 years, you're supposed to return your investors' money with, with profit, right? That's, that's, that's why it's investment. So if you're moving a lot of money, but there is no profit, then that's, that's a gap that we need to solve for. Africa is largely commission-based, but the discussion now is tilting towards, should we start adopting subscription-based pricing models for Africa? I don't have the answer, I promise you. I don't, there's no answer. But it's something that we need to start talking about. We are solving problems, right? But we need to start asking the questions of profitability and how to go about it. Keeping in mind that Africa is not exactly a very rich continent. So if you run a subscription-based model and your, the people who are supposed to use your products, your customers cannot afford you then. But either ways, we need to start making much more money than we are now. Distribution, yes, but distribution that also comes with revenue. The company cannot just keep running on investor money. Investor money is going to finish one day or the investors are going to ask you for profits or return on their money and if you don't have that, you may not be able to raise again and when you can raise again, what happens? Are you going to shut down? Are you going to take away the financial solution? that you're presenting us. So I'm going to end by saying th there's, there's a question for all of us to answer, and I promise you I don't have the answer, but you can meet me right there at the booth. We can, we can discuss options or how you think we can solve it. I'm very much open to that. Thank you. Thank you.